So I'm sorry for the inconvenience. So I'm still uh, uh, sharing my screen. Can you see everything full screen? Yes. 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 No, yes, yes. yes. <clears throat> and so uh, the artwork Return to Dill Moon is part of a series of the Policy NAS series. There are four experiments so far. And um, artistically and formally, the Policy NAS series centers around problems of um, symbolic representation. So, in general, especially in uh, Return to Dill Moon. And uh, <clears throat> the initial point of the works is always a symbolic representation. In the case of Return to Dill Moon, it's a bull's head, and um, which is a semantic form. And uh, so this uh, semantic form, we translate into a syntactic form, namely a DNA molecule. So which means uh, you have the image, it will be translated uh, into DNA, and then it becomes accessible to biochemical and physiological processes and can be altered there um, on a molecular level and then retranslated into an image again. That's so far clear. Please, um, you can interrupt me all the time if you have questions, right? Gunter, I just ask you to be, you know, very slowly, uh, uh, not yes. just for the English to be understood, but you are speaking slowly, but to explain all the steps, like where this is bullhead came from, yes, why yes. is this representation of the bullhead and not another image of a bullhead? Yes, this will come, but just like in the meantime, Okay, then let, let me continue. So in return to Dilmun, so we translated this image into a synthetic uh, DNA using our method. And uh, so the picture stored as a biochemical molecule uh, allows us to do retouching of the image on a molecular level uh, with CRISPR-Cas9. So what you can see here, um, on, you can see three images, and the first image is like the bull's head without the eyes. The second image, that's like the target where we want it to go, and the third image is then the actual result. Um, so what you wanted to do is like to insert the eyes using CRISPR-Cas9. And the CRISPR-Cas system is a prokaryotic immune system uh, that provides uh, adaptive immunity to a foreign uh, uh, genomic in injection, like uh, what happens uh, or foreign genomic elements, for example, by bacteriophages. Uh, these are viruses that go after bacteria and uh, the bacteria, they develop this uh, kind of immune system to get rid of those uh, genome injections again. And in the life sciences, uh, this system has been modified for efficient genome editing. So like um, most of the, of the tools uh, in, in biotechnology, they are merely uh, discoveries um, from, uh, let's see, uh, from, uh, procedures that are already out there in nature. So usually it's a mechanism that's already happening in bacteria, in, in, in other cells, and then it can be adapted uh, for biotechnology and for the use of, of uh, science cells. So it's the same with PCR and, and other kind of methods that are used. And uh, so the uh, original template shows the bull's head uh, with the uh, NP eye sockets. And after translation to DNA molecule, a pair of eyes were inserted using CRISPR-Cas9 and fusion PCR. So we did the whole experiment uh, in vitro uh, because uh, 
it was too risky and too time consuming uh, to kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, get through the whole uh, process of getting a license to do these kind of experiments at the Wach Society. And uh, I have to admit, uh, in the beginning, um, I was not aware on how the work with CRISPR-Cas9 really looks like. And we just, um, in the beginning, I think uh, Peter was the first one I was asking if we, we can do this uh, in the open wet lab at VAG and maybe we get a license for that. And uh, the, the question was like, how long will it take? And we took a little bit, you know, that the time frame of the of the CRISPR-Cas9 kits by Odin at the time. And so we we were thinking we, we were, you know, done like in an in one or two afternoons, you know, <clears throat> at the beginning, of course. And then like, uh, uh, you could say, it. so I thought, ah, if it's only, if it only takes a, a few afternoons, uh, let's invite a few friends from, from Amsterdam to join and uh, let's do this together and, you know, enjoy our, ourselves by, by using CRISPR-Cas9. And then I was talking to Federico Mufato and he said, yeah, it's not that easy, but I can still help you. And so the whole process started, but we decided quickly to do it in vitro. So we don't need any licensing process, uh, which could take up to 90 days to be worked on in the ministry. And then it was still like the, the outcome was quite unsure which in the end uh, complicated the whole procedure because a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the repairs and uh, the stitching uh, which would uh, normally happen inside of a, of a living cell, uh, we had to simulate in, in other procedures. And so here's the, to the question to the bull's head. So the bull is a representation of the corn spirit uh, hello. Marta can, you, uh, Marta, can you mute yourself? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Please go on. We, we are listening to you. I'm trying to find who is also making some sounds. Mm. I think it's... It's quiet now, please continue. Okay, yeah. So the, the bull's head is a representation of the corn spirits. Like George Fraser in uh, 1922 wrote extensive work. It's called The Golden Bow, where he tries to follow all the religious myths like to, to the very first being or as far back as it's possible, you know, like nowadays to go. And he found out like the 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 bull uh, head is like the representation of the corn spirit and was extremely meaningful in early agrarian societies because you, uh, especially in the uh, Fertile Crescent, one of the origins of the Neolithic uh, revolution. And, uh, but it was not just like growing crops, it was also a combination with animal husbandry. So you, uh, for the Neolithic revolution as such, like the, the combination was extremely important. So <clears throat> the bull played a, a, a very, very important role in, in all the myths you can find there. It doesn't matter if it's Sumerian or early Greek or whatever. So you find this all over the place. And um, at the beginning of great civilizations, a major cutoff from nature happens, or rather it's um, an alienation of these uh, uh, nomadic biorhythms and uh, <clears throat> which was uh, transforming the relations uh, of humans and other life forms after that drastically. Um, so kind of that, that was like a, kind of the, the expel from the Garden of Eden. Dilmun, so Eden is also a Sumerian word. It means like the, the last of the green lands uh, 
where the things are wild, you know, like the, the distinction between the, the police, the city and, and the nature. So it was like still like this, uh, this early like distinction between culture and nature starting to, <clears throat> to get into form at that time. And uh, so Dilmun, uh, it's a, a real place and also a mythical place. And there is like an, an archeologist, his name is Jurin Sarins. And he tried to locate the Garden of Eden. And like, although he's like a very rigorous scientist, he started um, uh, as one of his sources was actually the Bible, the book of Genesis. And here we also found, especially for my, for my Dutch friends here, uh, it tried to locate the paradise. It's like uh, where it's stated in, in, in Genesis in the Bible, where the four rivers meet. You know, it's the river Pishon and the river, river Gihon, the Euphrat and the Tigris. And so the Garden of Eden, paradise was located where the four rivers meet and uh, it was like in in the 70s late 70s and he had a friend at nasa and he was one of the first uh, people outside nasa that gets his um, hands on the landsat images and so he could try to identify the four rivers so the pishon he said it's the Vati Batim uh, Ice Age river system, which can only be seen now as traces. It starts like in Medina and goes all the way through the Arabian Peninsula to, to Basra, through what is now called uh, uh, countries like uh, <clears throat> and uh, the Gihon um, is identified as the Karun River, uh, which has its origin in the Kargos Mountain in, in modern Iran. And here you can see a little picture. And uh, the Wadi Batim was a typical Ice Age river, so it was like, 10 to 12,000 years ago when the, when the climate change happening at the end of the last ice age and uh, um, all the ice was melting and uh, the sea level rose. So until then, sorry, in the full screen mode, I cannot use my mouse, but uh, the whole area uh, from like what nowadays is like Basra, to the Strait of Hormuz was uh, still land and which is now underwater. So all the area, there was this, this, uh, this rich river banks and the people really had the, their everything. So they used the, the clay to build houses there. Uh, they had all kinds of, of fish and fruits and vegetable. And so this area was uh, seen as paradise because um, Cities like Ur, uh, Uruk, and, and those, they were still like, more like a, a embedded, like, a, or surrounded by this dry land as we know it today. And so these were for the Sumerian people, those kind of people, Dilmun, which is now maybe some, some, some excavation you can still find in Bahrain, they were um, seen as paradise. Okay, and so and now in the advent of CRISPR Cas9, it may well be that humanity undertakes a further cut off from nature by the possibilities uh, which are offered by modern gene editing techniques. And, uh, and again, it might be that our relation to all kinds of um, other forms of lives are, uh, are changed again very drastically. I mean, you should just think about the consequences that the Neolithic uh, revolution had. 
you know, you have like the formation of the first states, administrations, military, diplomacy, warfare, um, accounting, and from accounting there goes writing and mathematics. And you can see like uh, in the complexity developed like what we're living now today, it's just like astonishing. And, and so we, we could uh, speculate that like this, um, methods like gene editing could have like very drastic consequences in the future to come 1000 2000 3000 years we just think about the consequences we had with the neolithic uh, revolution and uh, <clears throat> so dilmun is a mythical place of the sumerian civilization which was shaped by exceptional biodiversity and which was sunken in the Shat el Arab um, after the deglacization. I mean, these were like complex processes, like in the course of thousand years, you know, like you have the deglacization, then you had the evaporation, and then you have like cold weather again and uh, combined with warring. So these were complex processes, but it, it shaped the, the the nature, especially there in the Middle East, yeah, extremely. And uh, so conceptions of immortality, uh, for example, like captured in the Gilgamesh epos. So the Gilgamesh epos is one of the oldest literature we have. And just like a, a short introduction to that. So Gilgamesh is king of Uruk. And it said that he was like two third God and one third human, which made him mortal. And so he tried to, to look at, he, he wanted to become immortal himself. And he tried to look at some examples, how to become immortal. And he, he comes across uh, the big flood story. Uh, from Utna Pishtim, and Utna Pishtim like saved a lot of the animals uh, and his family from the big floods. And uh, it's, this is one of the most important folk tales of uh, antiquity. Uh, maybe you know the story in the in the Bible. It's in Genesis. It's like Noah, the flood story. And since it was like um, since it was like a, a, it was in the beginning, it was like more like a, a spoken tradition. So like spoken and written traditions, they, they came along for, for a thousand years maybe. And so it always had like, you know, depending on where the story has been told, it also always had some, some kind of uh, a local color it, you know, when it was like, uh, because the, the story came from, from Dilmun, like from Bahrain, there were the caravans to the Mediterranean Sea, and we came to the Mediterranean Sea, which is uh, modern day um, Israel. And uh, for example, you know, the, the, the story slightly changed by having when the bird came back with the land, he had like a, 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 a branch of an olive tree, which he didn't have in the original story. So that's how the, the and this, the, the story of Utna Pishtim and Trasis, I think it's, it's his other name. You can find it in the Prometheus, in Ulysses. There's also the, the names in the Noah Bible story. So you have this very important folktale. You have it all over the, the flood story, which was one of the most important folktales in the ancient world. And so Gilgamesh <coughs> tries to find Utna Pishtim. Uh, which was granted with immortality. And he also, uh, he, he becomes a very good friend, uh, Enkidu, which was also like a representation of this transformation between, between uh, nature to culture uh, or from, from nature to culture, because he was like a, a creature of the wild and by by having like um, sexual intercourse with a prostitute for over for the course of over for two weeks and drinking, he became actually human, and he was like a companion 
for Gilgamesh and uh, after a few adventures, they really can, uh, or at least I think Enkidu yeah, dies on the way, and they really can, uh, Gilgamesh can really find uh, Utna Pishtim, you know, the, 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 the hero of the flood story. And he asked him how to, to become immortal. And uh, Utnap uh, and this, 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 this sleeping story he says, yes, um, I can, if you can stay awake, I think for seven days, <clears throat> um, I can, uh, immortality can be granted to you, but Gilgamesh falls, falls asleep uh, immediately and and he's very disappointed, uh, but uh, still Utenbishin cannot grant him immortality or the gods, but he can still say, hey, go to the Garden of Eden. There will be a plant, you can pick it up and you can reunite yourself. And Gilgamesh goes to the Garden of Eden, which is already underwater, and he finds that plant and he picks it up, but um, before he can return to, uh, to Uruk again with the plant, a snake takes away the plant, eats the plant and rejuvenates itself. So that was like, also this like imagination, like the, the snake is skinning itself and the re rejuvenation uh, <clears throat> comes into play here in this story too. So in the end, uh, he was very, um, Gilgamesh was very unsuccessful and returned to the city of Uruk, staying mortal. And uh, so these fictions of a carefree existence without melodies, becoming perfect humans in a perfect uh, environment are reinvigorated by, in the advent of CRISPR and the transformation of biology into a creative, Science, you know, like in German, a um, Schöpferische Wissenschaft, uh, which is seen to be the solution to um, all the problems uh, that humanity in, is facing, like climate change, environmental pollution, health, food production, species extinction, energy, energy production, and so forth, is expected in the engineering of the living. And so on, on the background of this elusive idea of DNA as a code, you know, just waiting to be cracked, <clears throat> um, the uh, problems emerge concerning the representational model of the DNA. And what I mean by that is like, just like saying, seeing this reduction that DNA is just a code to be cracked and uh, I think at the moment, um, all these metaphors are breaking down. You know, even like uh, <clears throat> the, the best or, or, or one of the best scientists in, in, in the world, like Greg Venter or George Church, they all, uh, all use those metaphors, like the DNA as the book of life and to rewrite it, open new chapters. You know, in, in the talks, they always have these metaphors, but I think, um, those metaphors are starting just to break down and just to see the DNA just as, as a code wait to be cracked and to be altered, you know, having the code, um, <clears throat> uh, a division between the organism and the code and all those kinds of things. I mean, the, there are the successes, but uh, I think like to, to overcome this, this kind of plateau we're in now, uh, the whole representation model of the DNA as a three dimensional structure have to be like renewed, that's it, in my opinion. And also I came to the conclusion like DNA as a storage uh, might not be, uh, it's, it's maybe technically feasible, but that there's, a, there's also like a, a problem because the, the kind of information that is stored in the DNA is totally different to the kind of information humans like to, to hold on to. I think that this is like a, a, 
distinctive human features that humans try to hold on to information, even if it's it's a, a hard to be reconstructed after a few thousand years. So if you go back to this anthropological, archaeological kind of thing, if you put it in stone and you find it a few thousand years later, it's for the most of the part, it, it's pure speculation what, what those figurines really meant for the people at that time, you know. And the information, the kind of information that's stored in the DNA doesn't want to hold on, you know, that's like a distinctive feature of the uh, of organisms that by the changes of uh, in the environment, that kind of information can adapt. So for the organism, it doesn't, doesn't matter if it's like a, a T-Rex now and the hundreds of million years later, it's a chicken, you know, it, it doesn't try to hold on to that specific form, you know, it's it's uh, that there's a high level of plasticity in those kind of information. And let me continue here. So here you can see the team. Uh, me, Roland, Federico Mufato, he's the main designer of the experiment. And here you all see hans jörg Pechko. He's a physicist. And he's like, um, in his day job, he's like programming high-end construction machines. And he helped with the programmation of the latest version of the software. You can see in the background all that's like the, the open wet lab in Amsterdam at the Wach Society. And here's like, um, just a small screenshot of uh, the designing of the experiment in Benchling. And we also did as a as a second part of the experiments, we did like uh, uh, off target experiments. So um, for like very efficient on target cleavage with CRISPR Cas9, you need like 20 nucleotides to really find the, the right spot in the DNA and make the cuts. And uh, we thought like to have like uh, more like an artistic outcome, like uh, uh, a difference between, to see a difference between before and after the experiment. We made also this off-target experiments having like sgRNAs with 15 and 12 uh, base pairs. And here you can see we have like random cuts and mutations all over. And here you can see, here's like the open wet lab in Amsterdam at the Wach Society. On the left side, you see, can see, we will talk about this later a lot. You can see the bottle of bleach we used extensively to clean everything up, to have the RNAs in check. Here is uh, a <clears throat> first gel run after the cleanup of the of all our uh, synthesized sequences. Here we have like uh, the, uh, the whole um, result, like, uh, like in gel run to cut it out and purify it. And so I was not the first one to come up with uh, the idea to transform digital data into DNA. This one, like the, the first uh, person I know who did it is like Joe Davis with his work, Micro Venus. And here is our first experiment in 2004. We just like took a small space invader, uh, like 10 to 12, you know, the, the pictures are all zoomed in because the pictures are, are way smaller, like the 10 to 12 pixels. And this was a space invader we trend, uh, we cloned into an uh, E. coli bacteria. So we uh, we had like um, the first uh, <clears throat> the first generation of our software. We translated the digital uh, image of a, a space invader and transformed it into a bacterial cell. And here you can see because like uh, we made a small vector, we had like. Um, our plasmid is the synthetic DNA 
there was the red fluorescent protein attached to it and also um, ampicillin resistance. And so that vector, you know, with this electroporese, there was like a, a poration of the membrane cell of the bacteria and uh, our molecule just diffunded into the bacterial cell. And then it was like on a, on a plate with uh, ampicillin and only the bacterial colonies that have adapted our synthetic uh, DNA plasmid, which was connected to the ampicillin resistance and the red fluorescent protein survived on that, on that plate. And here we had like a, a, the first uh, uh, visual confirmation that the experiment worked. So this was the second experiment we did, uh, mutants from inner space in 2008. So we had like uh, uh, animated GIF of Space Invader again. And this was also a, a in vitro experiment. And by, the, uh, by adding magnesium chloride, we could simulate uh, processes of mutation like what's happening with toxicity or radiation. And we just like, let our small animated GIF film like being mutated. And you can see in one experiment, it mutated quite, quite well. So you have a, a big deletion in the, the middle. You could also see this in, in, in other uh, DNA visualization uh, software. So we had this deletion in the middle and in, the, in, in a, one of, in another run, we just have like small mutations. You can see it's just like a few pixels that changed like in the, in the row. Yeah. You can see. Here's like what we ordered at that time. That's like the, uh, the vector we got for the uh, mutants from inner space. And we showed this in a, making like a, a shared uh, <clears throat> artistic experience. We showed this in an interactive installation. So you could uh, turn the pizza dishes and make before and after. Uh, so you can see how the, how the animated GIF changed. And this was the third um, experiment. So again, we used the technique that was uh, at that time used to anneal different DNA strands. Um, and the mechanism was, uh, 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 was discovered in the fake lambda bacterial fog. And it's also uh, altered and modified and used in biotechnology, used different kinds of DNA strands to put them together maybe also cloned into a cell. And so we'd use three different parts of the DNA and put them together. It's uh, called the multi-site gateway kit by in vitro gen, was like the outcome. And we also tried to, to, uh, to make it possible for the spectator to reenact it symbolically what's happening in the lab in an interactive installation. So you could use the three different kind of in a strand, so you can see a flute, the horn, and, and the hair. And you can see you could put them together and recombine them. And we also showed the E. coli bacteria in the exhibition space, as you can see here. And this is also part of the exhibition. So you can see the code of the different images we have. And it's, uh, it's referred to Müller-Pole, he was like a photographer and uh, he was one of the first one who, who made a, an exhibition with uh, digital photography, but instead of showing the image, he was just showing the, the codes. And so that was like, I think that's what we did here too. And we had like, some small 3D prints of small parts of the DNA. Yes, this is it so far. Do we have any questions?
Hey, I have a question. I'm sort of a curious, um, always when you say about that, you translate it, like in the beginning, when you show the bull mm -hmm. image, and they are very sort of a, um, mosaic or pixelated, and then you make the, the translation to the DNA molecule out of that. So yeah. like, if you can just briefly explain how that is made, and is that the reason mm -hmm. that they are so pixelated? Uh, the, the reason that it's uh, so pixelated, but maybe I, um, I share the screen again, just a second. Okay, they're so pixelated because these are uh, 25 to 26 um, pixels. And this was already, <clears throat> uh, uh, this resulted into 9,000 base pairs. And it was not possible to use bigger pictures. Because we started out, our first experiment was 10 to 11 pixels. And we, I tried to, uh, <clears throat> to escalate <laughs> the size in the course of the experiments, but like to have like constructs and work with constructs with 9,000 base pairs was a little bit state of the art. That's why I'm always very suspicious if people claim they can uh, store a whole movie or a whole musical part as DNA, because to make like constructs that big that goes over 9,000 base pairs it's, it's uh, almost impossible at one point because uh, you can only synthesize like about 200 uh, base pairs and then always you have to build constructs and put them together and together. Maybe Jose or can go deeper into, <clears throat> into the difficulties of processes like that. And so that's why it's pixelated because it was just like, um, it's a, a kind of a, a problem of funding to have like bigger, bigger pieces of data. And it's also hard to work on with DNA strands that are, that are uh, bigger than 9,000 base pairs. Even we had the problem, so we had to divide it into four smaller pieces with 1,950 base pairs to really work on it. And you still have the problems that it starts to fold again and, and you run in, into a lot of uh, technical problems to work with it. Uh, the other thing is how the translation works. You can see here the pixels with different colors. And we have a, made a software by our own, which takes the pixels and, and translates it to a text files with, uh, that only consists of four letters, A, G, T, and C, which are the four base, uh, bases of the DNA. And that text file you can send in and you get it synthesized and the order of the molecules refer to the order and the color of the pixels. That's, that's um, how the translation works. And because, but you also run into problems like that because like, uh, you have a lot of uh, repeats, which also makes it harder to, to synthesize the DNA. So that was also a problem. That's why we were waiting almost like two or three months for, for the results of the, of, the, of the process of synthesizing the DNA because they, they had so hard time because they have to repeat it all the time. Then they had to test it. Did it really work? And because of repeats, they, it doesn't go that fast. Uh, as it usually goes, if you just like synthesize small, small parts of the DNA. And the other thing is, of course, uh, there, there are some methods where you can uh, uh, store uh, more information in, in, in smaller parts. So you're not like efficient in the, uh, when it comes to, to data size. But what we want to have is when, when we see, because uh, we fundamentally see um, DNA as a as very dynamic and changing, like like what I was talking before. It's not doesn't try to hold on, you know, to a certain kind of because like uh, changes are introduced all the time, you know, having like these mutations, which is like uh, just like necessary for life at all. Uh, maybe without like having 
errors in copying, there wouldn't be any life anymore. It would be over just like a, a few runs maybe. So maybe sometimes for the individual, it's, it's very unfortunate to have those kind of mutations, but for a species or for life as whole, it's just like, uh, <clears throat> It's, it's un, in, in, uh, inviteable to, to have like these kind of mutations to constantly adapt to changes in the environment. And so, because if you use like uh, some kind of compression algorithms, it's just like one bit changes, it can destroy the whole information. And that's why we kept it a little bit more open that you can, that a small mutation or a small change in the DNA doesn't ruin the whole file, but you can see the small changes like by just flipping a few pixels, you know. That's why it's maybe not, not very efficient in to store a lot of data in, in, in a small piece of code, but it allows you to have changes back and forth, or back and forth translations all the time without destroying the whole picture. And it's just like, a, of course, it would be better to have like non pixelated high resolution pictures, but it's just like uh, technically not possible. You could also see because I was mentioning uh, Joe Davis before, because just uh, when we were ready, like in March 2017, I think I just came home from, from Amsterdam and me and Roland were the, like, like working the lab like crazy. They brought out the paper in nature, you know. But they did a similar experiment with the MyBridge image. Maybe you all saw it. Uh, with CRISPR cloning into a bacterial cell with CRISPR. It's with a, I think they have like a cell, uh, the, the CRISPR system they developed by themselves. So it was more sophisticated than because we just like, used like off the shelf uh, materials from, from manufacturers like New England Biolabs and such. And it just came out then and then you can see uh, if they publish this now in nature, maybe they did it like a year before because the reviewing process usually takes that, that time. So they, they were like early on, but you can see they also have like this pixelated picture, even with like unlimited funds of Harvard and, you know, like uh, the best uh, technically equipment you can think of, like nowadays, maybe in biotechnology at the, at the George Church lab they had to use like a very reduced kind of image to do those experiments. So you can see, so claimed you can store a lot of data into DNA. It's at the moment um, <clears throat> uh, uh, more like a, a speculation and not very handy in everyday data storage, data retrieval. So it, it needs like a few big, very good ideas to, to make this really work in like a everyday context. And then, uh, and then, uh, although if, if you can, can solve those kind of technical problems, then you run into this problem of sy uh, symbolic representation to what kind of, of data do you want to store? You know, you want to store like what you find now in the, in the internet. Like you want to store cat pictures or Wikipedia maybe, but is that, so it's very doubtful and questionable, you know. Did you have um, other ideas about uh, not using an image, but another type of media like text or uh, a music score or um, Yes, actually, the, the, the first generation of our software, we could use any binary file. But then again, we weren't able to see the mutations because then if one bit changes, the software couldn't determine is what it is. Is it a text file? Is it a musical file? Is it a video? So it would be possible to, to store any kind of, of binary code into DNA, but then you have to make it really mutation resistant. Because if you, because if you just have like the, the use the image data or using just like having like fixed containers, then you can, then it might be possible, but you have to be very careful, you know. 
And to keep it 100% mutation free will also be very hard to do because even like if you store it like in, 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 in radiation free chambers, I don't know, with German words, Bly, I don't know the <laughs> word with. Uh, I don't know if I, I can uh, uh, contribute a little bit, but uh, I mean, the, um, the, the re reliability of the copies, it's quite good of the DNA, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I totally agree with you, uh, Gunther, that uh, mutation and variability in, the, in DNA is uh, at the basis of life. That mm -hmm. will generate uh, diversity. Diversity mm -hmm. will generate new shapes and new forms. And that eventually will be selected by natural selection, what mm. works and what does not work. Um, but um, if you transform one bacteria and put it grow, uh, in a very few time, you'll have uh, thousands of thousands of bacteria, you know. But the, the reliability of those copies is quite good. Mm. Think, imagine that you try to do the, the same with your uh, hard drive and uh, doing the same 100 or 1,000 million copies of that, you will encounter errors. That happens. So it's not, uh, it's much more reliable, the replication of DNA. So to solve, maybe to solve the problem that you are uh, talking about, that is uh, mutation and uh, avoiding mutations or the distortion of information uh, that, are, that is associated with mutations that although, although it's not very frequent, but uh, it might happen because you have all these replicates going on. Maybe by redundancy, parallel redundancy, you know, you have one copy, one copy, one copy, one copy, and then you join all together to see the consistency of the information. You are going to have uh, multiple mutations that will follow different paths you know, but what you want is consistency between all these different uh, mutations that will arise mm -hmm. from all these different uh, lines. So could be one, one idea. So yeah, yeah. Starting with the same information in parallel in different uh, environments. And then at the end to retrieve the information, see the, the consistency that is transverse, transversal to all these different lines where mm -hmm. the information is stored. Could be one, one possible solution. Because at the end of the day, neither energetically, it's super efficient, the, the copies. Copying one hard drive is much more energetically demanding. And then the space that occupies, it's, uh, I mean, it's super tiny. It's super, super tiny. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, give, have this uh, luxury of having multiple, multiple copies using uh, the DNA is a, is a storage of information. Yes, of course. Um, what I was talking about is like, if you just look at the, what, what, what biology uh, biologists tend to do, looking at the syntactic form of the DNA, maybe you just have a few mutations and the rate is just astonishing and super things. But then you, but uh, the problem starts when you retranslate that into a semantic form again. Because then, if you just have like one mutation out of 10 million, but it's just like uh, that kind of bit that, that changes and uh, the re that retranslation process doesn't matter if it's by hand or by a software, cannot recognize anymore the data, what it is. Then you have like a whole bunch of that data. It's just like killed by one bit that flipped, you know. I got it, yes. And, and that, 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 that's a little bit the, the problem too. Uh, in a syntactic form, like just like using how it works in the, and in the cell and the cell can overcome those small errors and maybe changing the, 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 the ORF, you know, the open reading frame, and maybe run, it, it might work, but like having like the translation approach to make it human again, then, mm -hmm. then you run into a problem with those mutations. And it's not just like the copying errors, it's also kind of no matter where you start because you still have like uh, radiation from outer space and maybe once in a while, one of these particles just like <laughs> hits one of those molecules, you know, you, you, you cannot uh, exclude it like 100%. And no, that's no. why like, and that, that's a different kind of thing because uh, as a human, when you have a kind of, 
of, of information, you want to have it that it's that's been that that it's been uh, that it will be read in the same way like you understand the information. Okay, you have like a text, and you want that everybody understands this part of text exactly the same way you do, even in five thousand years. But maybe in five thousand years you lose your whole reference framework you cannot make sense out of the text again you know then then you run into this problem and those kind of thing but but nature itself doesn't care you know it's just like information is gone new information is provided you know like like to have another metaphor i use on the home which it's it's like a, a a computer software that builds its hardware around and the hardware around changes the computer software again, and this in ongoing evolutionary processes. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and it doesn't but, try to hold on. You know, if it doesn't work anymore, it's gone. You know, it's yeah. But maybe you don't need to have uh, bacteria growing for one million years. You just need to freeze them, and that's yeah. it. Although they will uh, eventually degrade the information. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, I have to tell you uh, that that was a little because um, I was starting digital art and it was the beginning of the internet. And uh, at one point it came clear to me that all this information, it's so much information that's produced like, and you have access to it like in a unprecedented in humankind, you know, you have now access to millions of songs, you know, because like 150 years in Austria, if you wanted to have music, you have to learn an instrument, you know, or you have to force your kids to learn an instrument and they play it like in the living room. You know, it was like that was the kind of now you have like access to every genre ever ever occurred. The, the most distinguished, uh, rarer stuff you can find now on YouTube. You know, that, that's. I mean, who wants to give up on that? <clears throat> but it's also like very vulnerable because it can be, you know, just like. Uh, what, what do the anthropologists say? We are just four meals away from the, from the, how you say, the, the collapse of civilization, you know? You just, like after the meal is left out for four days, you know, civilizations really run into deep problems. Mm -hmm. I think with Roland, it's a few days earlier. <laughs> I mean, uh, I like think... <laughs> I think now the challenge is uh, to select the information that we should be absorbing, right? Not, yeah, yeah. Uh, not the avail availability of it. I mean, I'm, who am, to, uh, am I to complain that there are a lot of uh, startups? And also what I said with this metaphor, the NASA code, there are a lot of successes with that. You know, you need this kind of reduction. It was also like what I'm uh, telling you before, like how writing came about, just came about uh, because people couldn't memorize who's owning whom a cow, you know, it was like, okay, you owe me five sheep. That was like, with those tokens, CFOs it's called, they were like just some symbolic representations of, of numbers and things for accounting. And the whole concept of mathematics drove out of this, who's owning whom a cow. And now we have non-Euclidic mathematics, you know, like the, this development is just like mind blowing. <coughs> And so you need this kind of reduction. We're talking about this, like uh, Hans Jörg Reinberger was talking about. He's a philosopher, but he's also a trained biologist who worked in the labs. So I think he's a protein kind of experiment he made. And they also said, yeah, like you have this kind of reductions which open up, opens up the mind again to to draw new conclusion, making new connections. You know, but in the end, you have to make it a small, this kind of hybrid cyborg kind of experimental setup. You know, where they can electricity and then you have living cells and a microscope and whatever kind of, of, of apparatuses you did they're connected to there and you just have like the small stage and then after that it, it opens up again like the mm -hmm.